Hello, good evening, everybody. It is uh, simply a great pleasure to meet with you again after a short period of interruption because of all kinds of important obligations that we have in the world. But now we are here again. And thank you so much for coming, coming and sharing with us um, a talk and a debate and participating in this debate. Uh, I first, before presenting the special guest of this evening, I would like to remember that some extraordinary figures of the invisible community of legal scholars left us. Uh, Ronald Dworkin, who took rights seriously, he left us some weeks ago. Um, J.D.M. Derrett, the great scholar of Hindu law, left us too. And during a conference in um, at um, Delhi, uh, we remembered um, his work, great work, with a wonderful uh, contribution, written contribution by uh, Vanamensky. And last but not least, uh, I would like to mention the name of Stefan Essel, who left us just, I think, a week ago, and uh, whom we had intended to invite because his approach uh, to irritate a young generation at the age of 95 was really extremely challenging for uh, a lot of us who uh, are mostly asleep. And he was not. And uh, he was a great figure. And uh, if you ever had the chance to listen to his way to explain the world and to explain what it means to become normatively engaged by having feeling empathy and giving a place to, to feelings at all, and this might even play a role in the debate uh, this night. Uh, I think uh, that there is, this is really a great loss, uh, independently of his cinematic uh, role uh, for Jim et Jules, uh, where uh, in, in the movie done by Truffaut, uh, his parents, mother and father, played the background of the interaction between Jeanne Moreau and the other person, I don't remember exactly who uh, the actor was, whatever. Today, we have the honor to uh, listen to a talk by Honey, uh, Dr. Honey van Rijswijk. Uh, we could try to pronounce it uh, the correct Dutch way, but it would not be completely correct because you're living in Sydney and um, from this background, as a legal scholar, graduate of the University of Sydney, but then having traveled around the world and seeing great colleges, um, for example, Trinity College in Dublin, uh, then a PhD received from University of Washington, where you were a fellow in the Society of Scholars at the Simpson Center for the Humanities, you taught at several universities in Australia, the United States, in order to come back to Sydney and to be uh, a, a senior lecturer at the law school of the University of, at the University of uh, Technology, Sydney. This means you are not only teaching taught law, uh, jurisprudence in general, legal history, social justice issues, but especially, and this is um, the reason why uh, we have the honor to receive you this evening, to work in the field of law and culture studies. This, as you know, is something rather unfamiliar to the uh, German debate, there are some crazy persons interested in this topic, as for example at this center, but in general it doesn't play such a big role. 
in the German debate. In the United States, is, it's, it's really different. Uh, the law schools, not only at Cardozo Law School, it is a subject taught regularly and with normative consequences, where literature is not just a mirror, a reflection of social structures as uh, the sociologists of art and literature sometimes are saying, but where literature can be regarded as a source of normative validity. And this is something quite different. And there are contexts in which this, cr this way of finding other sources or uh, other ways to law uh, are very important. It may be done by pictures as we listened to uh, Mani Singh uh, in, um, in, in India uh, uh, a week ago and you will do your talk uh, during the next uh, weeks uh, or another kind of talk uh, certainly deepened uh, with deepened insights as we hope uh, from the context we are discussing in, but uh, in a very fascinating way. And uh, today there is a possibility to learn also what jurists, people who work in the large field of the normative sciences, whatever this is, I think we have to think about that. There is some, some commonness in, in those disciplines that deal with normativity, normative structures. In those sciences, where the deontic power plays, so to say, to learn about the role of literature for testifying, for testimonies and what literature can teach us in order to solve normative juristic problems but perhaps also to understand better how and why literature is articulating it in a certain way. For all those questions uh, I could not imagine somebody uh, better prepared than you and I feel very much honored and we feel honored that you came over from London in order to give lectures uh, at, uh, at, at, at uh, not Göttingen, at, at, at Gießen very soon uh, and meeting a good friend of this house, uh, Greta uh, Olsen, who will be fellow in one year in the law and literature um, research year of this center. So, um, welcome and uh, we are really curious to listen to your talk. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for such a, a warm welcome. And, and also thank you for the, to the Law as Culture Centre for its kind invitation and for hosting today's lecture. Tonight I want to talk of testimony and how the possibilities and limitations of the testimonial form relate to justice. The testimonial form has been used in a number of legal and quasi-legal proceedings to respond to extra extraordinary events. In the Truth and Reconciliation Commission proceedings in South Africa, as a way to evidence experiences of the stolen generations in Australia, and in proceedings responding to the wars in Rwanda and Bosnia, to name just a few examples. This paper focuses on the Australian perspective and uses this archive to ask questions about the role of testimony as a particular form of representation that shapes and limits the possibilities of justice, both within and outside the law. This paper looks at the stories produced through Stolen Generations testimonies, of the individual narratives that make up the repository, and also the history and form of the testimonies as a whole, of the story of the testimonies collectively, and how this overarching story has shaped the possibilities of justice outside the law. I want to begin with a timeline of Stolen Generations testimony and its place in legal, extra-legal and cultural discourses. This is important not only in providing context for this paper, but also in explaining the shaping of testimony and how it has achieved its current form, the possibility it makes available for justice and those it limits. Historian Bain Atwood suggests that the Stolen gen Generation's narratives was formed by a number of processes. 
And so we start to see an arc forming um, of, of what is expected from the solar generations. Um, and that is that arc is reproduced um, in the different testimonies, so in the individual testimonies. So we begin in the 1980s um, with a change in historiographical practices. So a shift to bottom-up history with its emphasis on common voices and testimony that makes available um, these kinds of practices of recording history. And then we look to institutional forces. So in 1980 or 91, um, Reid is commissioned by a government body to prepare a report providing historical background to the contemporary phenomenon of child separation. And in doing so, he uh, bases his findings um, on his experiences in LinkUp, which is an agency that he founded with Coral Edwards um, in the early 1980s. And Coral Edwards had also been separated from her family as a child. And the purpose of this agency was to reunite members of Aboriginal families who had been separated um, by the practice of child removal. So here we have the idea that narrators tell their stories to an institution um, and Batwood, Atwood suggests that the form and content of their accounts tends to be shaped by the knowledge of what the institutional audience expects to hear and this is especially so in this kind of institutional context. So by the late 1980s, we have Reed's report being generated, so that the, the lost generations, that's the, that then becomes the stolen generations report, so this phrase is coined by Reed. Um, and then in the late 1980s, we have a series of films and autobiographical narratives that document stories of removal, so a, a cultural creative ways um, of also telling the story of child separation. And then as um, a key point, we have the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission, the HERIOC, um, uh, issuing a report bringing them home after their national inquiry, and the report is published in 1997. And here testimony played a special function, so it was a way of obtaining knowledge about the past, um, but it was also a way of transmitting the past in a way to enable those who bore its burdens to be heard and healed. So it wasn't only about um, discovering the truth, but it also had a therapeutic purpose. And uh, after the publishing of this report, we had the first Sorry Day event, so uh, a formal day to commemorate um, the, the stolen generations um, and, and a way for the Australian public to um, I suppose experience its apology, um, but we at the same time we have the, the then Prime Minister John Howard refusing to apologise to stolen generations and, and he said Australians of this generation should not be required to accept guilt and blame for past actions and policies over which they had no control. Uh, and it was more than 10 years later that we had Prime Minister Kevin Rudd finally on the 13th of February 2008 formally apologising um, to members of the Stolen Generations. So the Bringing Them Home report um, is an, an immensely important report in this context. So it, it's textual practice was to embed in its text fragments and extended passages of first person testimonial accounts that had been given before the commission of inquiry, usually in confidence. The statement at the beginning says, throughout this report, the authors remain faithful to the language used by the witnesses quoted and that the intent is to relay as many of those individual stories as possible. So it therefore makes a claim to a discursive justice. It's a didactic text, so one of its main purposes was to educate the mainstream public regarding the issues of the stolen generation. So one of the purposes was the awareness that most Australians had very little knowledge about the fact of the stolen generations. The final report was the most popular government um, publication ever published. It was sold everywhere, including supermarkets. Um, page two of the report says, 
The devastation of stolen generations cannot be addressed unless the whole community listens with an open heart and mind to the stories of what has happened in the past and having listened and understood commits itself to reconciliation. So there's a connection there to the official um, means by which Australia uh, is seeking to resolve issues of injustice regarding Indigenous Australians, reconciliation um, and also that empathy and, um, and sympathy and affect will be a major way in which that will progress. So the, so the report was commissioned under Section 11 of the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission Act. Its terms of reference included tracing past laws, practices and policies which resulted in the separation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families by compulsion, duress or undue influence. Um, and there are a number of other terms of reference. And also examining the justification for comp compensation um, for those. So, so they're the, the two key that I want to, uh, points that I want to um, touch on. Their findings were that between one in three and one in ten Indigenous children were forcibly removed from their families and communities from 1910 to 1970 and that this constituted cultural genocide under the UN Genocide Convention and also customary international law. The report recommended the use of the United Nations Van Boven principles for victims of gross violations of human rights, including a full range of reparation measures, restitution, compensation, rehabilitation, satisfaction, and guarantees of non-repetition. And it also recommended a national apology. So the Prime Minister at the time refused to apologise and then in 2008 um, Prime Minister Rudd did apologise, um, but his apology only went so far. Uh, in the apology he did not acknowledge the full degree of the damage caused by removal policies to individuals and to Indigenous communities through the destruction of Aboriginal cultural identity and language. And he didn't commit to a federal reparations or compensation scheme as had been recommended by the Bringing Them Home report. So in 2012, there's no federal reparations scheme and only one successful case at common law, the Trevorrow case, which I'll, um, I'll talk about later. And it's at this point that the Stolen Generations Testimony Project is launched which is an initiative of the Stolen Generations Testimonies Foundation and partly funded by the federal government. The foundation filmed the personal testimonies of members of Australia's Stolen Generation survivors in 2009 and then published them online in 2012. So one question I have is why in 2012 do we have another iteration of the testimony regarding Indigenous suffering? And how do we read these testimonies in ways that most bene benefit survivors of the Stolen Generation's experiences? These testimonies have had to do a lot of work. They've needed to establish the fact of removal and the racist policies behind removal. They push against a legal archive that has mostly denied the terms um, of the Stolen Generation's story and also a public space that has often denied the truth of the Stolen Generation's experience. But with the 2012 testimonies, we have an unevenness in comparison with the Herioch findings. We have the same testimony, or the same form, as bringing them home, but we no longer have the rights discourse or human rights discourse. So we have the suffering without the claiming, de-emphasising the responsibility side of the Stolen Generation's experience. I want to now turn to a particular story that representative of the archive, and this is from the 2012 archive. Donna Meehan is a Gamilaroi woman from Kinambal, North West New South Wales. She lived with her people for the first years of her life, and she remembers being very happy during this time, playing with her siblings and cousins during the day, and being sung to sleep by her aunties and grandparents at night. One day in 1960, when Donna was five years old, her mother received a letter, and soon after, Donna and her six brothers and sisters were put on a train. A white woman wearing a red hat came and sat beside them. When the train suddenly pulled away, Donna looked back at the platform and saw her mother standing there with Donna's aunties. They were all weeping, waving goodbye to Donna and the other children. Donna pressed her face against the window and watched her mother for as long as she could 
until the blue dress her mother was wearing faded into a blue dot. It was the first time in her life that Donna remembers feeling frightened. She cried and her older brother Barry, who was nine, put his arm around her and said not to worry, he'd look after her. He was crying too. When they arrived in Sydney, Barry and her other brothers were taken away and the white woman said Donna would see them soon. The train continued to Newcastle. When it arrived, Donna was told to go with her new mummy and daddy, a white couple who would give her something to eat. So she went, her eyes stinging from all the crying she'd done on the overnight train trip. Donna's foster parents were kind, but she was lonely. She was the only child in the house and she missed being around her extended family. She missed playing with her brothers, sisters and cousins, and she missed the music. Her new home was so quiet. She was the only Aboriginal child at each primary school she went to and was called names. By the time she was nine, she was full of anger towards her family for abandoning her. By the time she was 13, she was in denial about her Aboriginality. She remembers seeing Jimmy Little on the television at 14, and it was the first time she had seen another Aboriginal person since she'd left Canamble. As a young woman with a husband and a baby, she was suicidal because of the feelings of loneliness and emptiness, of being so disconnected from white society and so alienated from Aboriginal people. Donna was 27 when she first met her mum. Her mother had been told that Donna had been sent away to New Zealand, so she'd stopped looking for her. She told Donna, if I knew you were here in Newcastle, I would have walked all that way just to find you. When Donna asked her mum why she'd been given away, her mother's eyes welled up with tears and she told Donna she didn't know why her children had been taken and that she'd wanted to kill herself many times because of it. The only thing that had stopped her was the thought that she needed to be there when her children came home. These testimonies are important and should be seen as present day calls for a full response to the stolen generations for suffering that is ongoing and which has not been fully redressed. A call for responsibility on the part of the Australian state and public that has not been fully taken yet. In a tradition that began with the, the Bringing Them Home report, these testimonies provide accounts of the suffering caused by the policies of child removal. Most important, they illuminate the ongoing and present day stakes that lie at the heart of the history of, sto of the stolen generation. The publication of these testimonies is an important reminder of the connection between history and justice, that survivors' stories are not narrations of the past for the sake of the past, but that the history of the stolen generations is a critical social justice issue now. It's important that these testimonies be understood as a history of and in the present, of the ways in which the laws and practices surrounding the removal of children have shaped survivors' present day lives, as well as present day public life in Australia. They make available to everyone evidence of the present his recent history of the Australian nation, which is so important because contention over the history of Australia's past in both legal and cultural realms has been a central means by which justice to Indigenous Australians has been denied. These testimonies put into the public sphere the means by which all Australians can judge the past and the present and realise the responsibilities that arise through this understanding. There is confusion in Australian law and society about the history of the stolen generations and responsibility in the present for this history, which is supported by a number of harmful stories. One of these stories is that the issue belongs to the past, that both suffering and responsibility are past phenomena that are regrettable but distant to us, and that the best approach is for everyone to move forward. But these testimonies show that both suffering and responsibility belong to the present, being marked as, as being published in 2012 and being given in 2009, they show that the pain of removal is contemporary and ongoing and will continue into the future. And that responsibility for these policies is embedded in state, law and cultural practices, institutions that need to be examined and accounted for. Another harmful story concerns the rationale behind the policies of removal, that children were removed because of the neglect or through the consent of their parents. These narratives are particularly damaging because they get to the heart of the reasons and policies that lay behind the removals. Time and again, across the testimonies, survivors tell of their awareness of the government's policies of removal based on a racist logic concerning half-caste children. Survivors tell of the contradictions between their government files and what they experienced during removal, 
and in the homes of foster families and institutions that the race-based reasons for removal and the abuse and mistreatment that followed were not documented, were misrecorded or even deliberately lied about. This is why oral testimony is so important because it provides a way to push against histories, mainly documentary, that are still circulating in important places and which need to be challenged. The harm caused by these policies began at the point of removal and has extended into the present. What arises across the tes testimonies is evidence of the continuing toll, the enduring emotional pain of separation, and also the ongoing effects of those traumatic experiences of abandonment. These effects include an inability to trust other people, to trust life itself, because of the fear that sudden shock and uprooting may happen again. Lorraine McGee Sipple tells of her continuing grief at her decision not to marry the man she loved, nor to have the children she de dearly wanted, because her experiences as a stolen generation survivor left her with the belief that there was something wrong with her that she didn't want to pass on. She said, I couldn't have a relationship. I thought, once you get to know me, you won't like me either. McGee Sipple did well in her nursing career, received important awards, but it didn't mean a thing to her. She has had bouts of serious oppression and suicidal periods. Donna Meehan says that her grandfather, mother and herself all came to the point of suicide as a result of the removals. Marie Melito Russell describes the anguish caused by the neglect she suffered with her foster family, especially the sexual abuse by her foster father and the racism of both foster parents. She describes the difficulties of trying to heal over the years, that time never wipes away the pain. For Marie, despite the extensive neglect and abuse suffered after her removal, the biggest loss was the loss of her mother, missing out on having grown up with her, and the knowledge that, had things been different, Marie's mother would have had her too. The testimonies illuminate the intense suffering caused to those individuals and communities left behind, in addition to that experienced by the children who were taken, of mothers and fathers who died of broken hearts, became vulnerable, turned to alcohol, gave into despair, as one does when one's heart is broken. They also tell of the suffering caused by the powerlessness of the parents, especially the mothers, in their attempts to have their children return to them, of their endless waiting and of the silence that met their pleas. The effects of intergenerational trauma are well established. The damage to descendants is caused by the difficulties survivors have experienced in trusting, forming relationships and being parents themselves. The damage to indigenous cultures and languages are ongoing because the removals broke up communities, destroyed the intergenerational links so necessary for the transmission of language and culture. The present nature of this suffering means that Australia's responsibility lies in the present too, not in the past. To say otherwise is to leave the burden of that suffering with Indigenous communities, a result that is unjust. Australia has tentatively approached the issue of responsibility for the stolen generations, but this responsibility has not been fully developed. Reticence to take full responsibility is often expressed as a story about history and time, as a belief that time for full responsibility lies behind us in the foreign country of the past a place that is so strange and different from our current laws and norms that responsibility now does not make sense. Although ambivalent about responsibility, Australians have been better at demonstrating compassion and empathy towards survivors of the stolen generations. The Bringing Them Home report provided a way for Indigenous testimonies of experience of the stolen generations to become significant in the public sphere bringing out for public judgment evidence of the treatment of Indigenous people, especially women and children, through violent policies of assimilation and child removal. The, the report demonstrated the systemic coercive practices, lies and violence that were at the heart of the removals, dispelling the idea that these removals occurred on the basis of the best interests of children. These testimonies encourage empathic engagement. But there is a dark side to the effective response because it can appear that something is being done towards the furthering of social justice when it isn't. Lauren Belant has written of this as the problematic politics of true feeling. Analyzing the public sphere in the United States, Belant questions, quote, a popular belief in national sentimentality, a rhetoric of promise that a nation can be built across fields of social difference through channels of affective identification and empathy, end quote. 
Sentiment sentimentality, she argues, quote, is the means by which mass subaltern pain is advanced in the dominant public sphere as a true core of national collectivity. It operates when the pain of intimate others blurs into, into the consciousness of classically privileged national subjects in such a fashion that they feel the pain of flawed or denied citizenship as their pain. A certain affect or empathy is felt without the experience of the material conditions that cause the pain, end quote. In the context of stolen generations, bringing them home provided a medium through which indigenous testimonies of suffering circulated in the public sphere and prompted readers to identify empathically with the suffering. The Sorry Books campaign later gave the public the opportunity to bear witness and respond to that pain. These archives are experienced as sites of suffering rather than, for example, sites of injustice or sites that lead to the articulation of claiming the end point of empathy should be responsibility, and it is here that work needs to be done, work that can in turn alleviate the suffering and set groundwork for the future. It is important then to read these testimonies not only as documents of suffering, but as documents as re of responsibility, because at the same time that they record survivors' suffering, they also record the acts of the state, society, and of law that caused or contributed to the suffering. And these aspects of responsibility tend to be downplayed um, in, in terms of the, the arc of the stolen generation story, which emphasises the event of removal and the suffering that took place su uh, subsequent to removal. What does meaningful responsibility mean in this context? The starting point is first time, to see this as an urgent present time question, not as a question about a static and remote past. And second, to look at the relationship between oral testimony and the documentary record. A significant source of trouble has been what counts as the evidence upon which the past is judged in Australia. The removal policies generated their own documentary trail, often found to be problematic, and which is contradicted by the oral testimony of a number of survivors and their families. There is a way in which the government's documentary archives have generated their own force, their own law, their own version of the truth, and this in turn has put harmful stories into circulation. These stories are taken up by the law, which not only judges claimants negatively against these stories, but in turn puts into the public sphere an understanding of the stolen generations and what happened. And so here we have an example of law functioning as culture and producing narratives around the stolen generations. Histories rely on their archives, and so what counts as the archive, as the evidence of history, is crucial. So Australian law and public life have put great store in the documentary archive. There's been a habit of trusting government records about policies of child removal instead of the testimonies of those who were removed and their families. Clearly, the ag agencies responsible for removing children had an interest in telling their story a certain way, supported by a document documentary record that they were responsible for creating. It is fair to examine these records as part of history, but they should not necessarily be taken as truth or given more weight than the testimonies of survivors and their families as a matter of course. Oral testimonies are an effective means to meet this force, to put into the public domain alternative stories to those that had been based on state records. The, these latest testimonies describe a number of moments in which survivors first encountered their government file. It, it's an extraordinary thing to imagine being handed a folder that tells the state's version of why you were removed from your family, perhaps what was said, what your mother was wearing, all the details considered important by the state, and how the story of your removal was crafted. The files contain fragments of stories, facts and lies, names and dates that may or may not be familiar to the reader. Across the testimonies, there are accounts of the ways in which government files took on a power in the lives of survi survivors, both before and long after removal. Many survivors tell stories of anger and distrust, of feelings of betrayal at being taken away. Why did their mothers let them go? Why didn't their families and communities come to get them and take them home? Survivors talk about bad relationships with their mothers upon reunion, of feelings of deep anger and hurt based on a misunderstanding of the circumstances around their removal. They describe terrible remorse upon realising the truth. Maria Starshevik says, One day I said to my mother, You, when I needed you, you weren't there. You know, I accused her of not being there as I was growing up. I just broke down, you know. 
And that's when she said, but I did come looking for you. Of course, that ended up in a heated argument, and then we never, ever discuss it again. A couple of years after her mother died, Sartovic received her government files. I got it sent through the mail, and I just went into my bedroom and read it. And I just broke down, you know, and in one of the papers that I've got, they said, ah, uh, the ward, that's who they used to refer to you. The ward's mother called at our office today. She's now Mrs Henderson of Malakuta, very fashionably dressed. Now what's that got to do with the price of fish? You know, just nitpicking. And they wouldn't, wouldn't even tell her where I was. And then of course I accused her of not coming and looking for me. And uh, she told me she had. Well, when I got my papers, I found that she'd been looking for me. And of course by this time she died. So I've got to live with that every day. I didn't have time to apologize to her. It haunts me that I couldn't, couldn't really tell her how, how sorry I was, you know. And you know, as I've got older, I've understood a lot more of how, what hard times were. I meant, I mean, she had had a battle, but then, you know, you've got to live with those things. Mothers often wrote to the authorities to beg for the return of their children, but these letters were ignored or responded to with threats. Lester Ma, Vince Wenberg and Gus Wenberg all speak of finding letters in their files from their mothers, fathers and grandparents begging for the return of their children. After her children were taken, Deborah Hocking's mother, Jean, wrote again and again to ask for them to be returned. Dear sir, I'm writing once again for you to consider letting me have my babies. Please sir, if there's anything else I have to do to prove myself, could you tell me what it is? I'm just waiting to give my whole life in making up to my babies for the past, but sir, the waiting is almost unbearable. I've paid dearly for my mistakes a hundred times over by being parted from my children. Her letter had no effect. Deborah Hocking played a large role in advocating for the rights of stolen generation survivors in Tasmania and was part of the movement to introduce a, a state-based reparations scheme there. Her testimony focuses on the role of government policies and records of practices of racism and surveillance. Uh, it's, it's a 30 minute um, testimony, so I just wanted to play you a little of it so you can get uh, a feel for her testimony. Uh, my name's Deborah Hocking. I'm a descendant of the Muhanina people from South East Tasmania. I'm a stolen generation survivor. Um, I have um, some academic qualifications uh, that I've been to uni and studied very hard for in Aboriginal health, which has helped me understand a lot of the um, physical problems in our community today, but also the spiritual and emotional problems which we all tie in together. I'm the chair, Aboriginal chair of Stolen Generations Alliance. We um, liaise with Stolen Generations all around the country um, to uh, take their needs forward uh, if they find it difficult to do that. And as far as linking up families and, and you know working with link up services and, and so on. At that period of time in Tasmania, I'm talking the early 60s, and there was still this continual act of we have to diminish Aboriginal people. No matter how pale they look, they're still Aboriginal. We've still got to bust them up, split them up. And that was the intent of the government of the day. Now, you won't find any document that will tell you that. But I tell you now, that's, that is what happened. Those people going into the homes that represented the welfare department were plucked off the streets to do the job. They weren't experienced. They were ex-teachers, ex-police, you know. They weren't experienced. They didn't care. They had no understanding of what it meant, what the impact of removing children actually would have. Um, all they were just incessant with were, were just busting up the Aboriginal families. And the Tasmanian government has now recognised that and apologised for it. So it's, this is not something that I'm, you know, out there with. It has been... Uh, the evidence has been gathered and there has been an apology and compensation paid. So for anybody out there that might sort of suggest, well, you know, perhaps the mum was neglecting them a bit, you know, think again, because the government certainly has. What I can tell you, firstly, is what I read in the file. It's not something I remember as a child because I was just too young. According to my government file, at the age of 18 months, I was removed from my family, as were my other siblings. Illegally, we were split up. Now, even back in those days, it was the law to actually keep children together. But we were split up. Now, my older sister was six and remembers it very vividly, us being taken away. It was on the grounds of neglect. Now, I know we so often hear neglect. Now, when I gave evidence into the Bring Them Home report, Sir Ronald Wilson, the late Sir Ronald Wilson, 
um, ask if he could read my file, which I gladly showed him. And as he went through the file, uh, he said, there's no evidence of neglect here. I said, no, that's what I thought. According to my file again, uh, there were several attempts to place me, but um, it wasn't easy because I was fretful, because I was still being breastfed. So, yeah, so um, uh, I looked at the, the placements and, and uh, this child is so unhappy, this child is fretting, I can't possibly take this child on. So there was a series of that of being shifted around, and again, I have no memory of that. Probably a good thing. <laughs> um, I was placed with a foster home um, in a location in Hobart that were uh, deemed suitable for placement. They were religious people. They were had a fairly high standing in the community. Um, they already had four children of their own, um, and yet I was placed with them. The archive demonstrates a deep psychological toll on survivors. They describe how their feelings of rejection and abandonment were often fed by the official stories of removal, supported by the state's file. And here the, the story of neglect is, is one of the, the dominant stories that have caused so harm. So the state's file often contained documents purporting to neglect, um, or which also purported that their parents had consented to, even requested their removal, statements that later proved to be false. This point is taken up in a number of testimonies, and reading them one can feel the hurt caused by the wrongful judgment, survivors pointing out that their families perhaps didn't have much money, as was the case for many Indigenous families, but that they were never neglected, and that they were very much loved by their families and happy. And, and another point about poverty is that often, this is, in the, I mean, this is obviously in the context of structural racism where, where poverty is more likely, um, and, and so the finding of neglect is, is in some ways doubly cruel. To be taken from your family is a horrible traumatic event, but this is compounded by the damaging story that it was your family's fault that you were taken, that your mother neglected you, that your mother didn't want you. This is a story frequently told in the government files, and it's contradicted by the oral testimonies of the children who lived in those families and their, and their families, or people who knew the families, um, and sometimes also by the government documentary archives themselves. Deborah Hocking, who we just heard from, points out that these findings of neglect were a matter of interpretation, a mechanism used to remove children. When Hocking first opened her government file, the first document she saw was a writ of conviction regarding her purported neglect, which made her a ward of the state. She describes the shock of encountering that document and the disconnection between her memories of early childhood and this document that claimed she had been neglected. Hocking provided evidence to the Bringing Them Home inquiry and describes the way her evidence was interpreted. When I gave evidence, Sir Ronald Wilson asked if he could read my file, which I gladly showed him. And as he went through the file, he said, there's no evidence of neglect here. I said, no, that's what I thought. Hocking also describes the terrible irony of being removed from a loving family on the grounds of neglect and then being placed with an abusive family whose violence led to no recourse. You know, they'd go to church on Sunday and then rape you on Monday. And the welfare authorities would, you'd have to meet with them. And they'd say, now, are you happy? Of course you'd have to say you were happy. If you didn't, you got a flogging. I got many floggings, I can tell you. Hocking recounts the story of her mother's life and the ways in which her mother's attempts to try to preserve her Aboriginal heritage were coded as neglect. Her Aboriginality was at the heart of the reasons behind the removal of her children. Hocking says, I look at my government file and look at how it all happened and how tragic it must have been for her and how she wanted to continue her culture and the authorities said, no, you actually can't do that because if you do, if you can continue to, you know, raise your children in this way, we'd say it's neglect. Hocking's mother, Jean, tried to raise her family under constant monitoring and amidst threats of the children being taken away. My older sister said, she said, oh, it was just awful because, you know, they'd be, they had to keep all the curtains open and the minute they saw a car pull up, you know, she said she'd run around and she'd try and make sure that everything, there was always something that she hadn't done. She was so scared because she knew that if they found anything, anything, a box of matches in the wrong place, what happens if the kids get hold of them? You know, Jean, you've been told about this. You know you've got to put that away. You know you've got to have more food in your cupboard. Otherwise, we're going to have to take your children, you know. Poor Jean. There she was, poor old mum, you know, running around, making sure everything was all right. 
The conflict between the state records and the testimonial evidence is a story of power. The ways in which the records were produced were the ways of power, including duress, deceit and negligence, because the people involved in the removals got to tell the story, to document the story their way. Challenging these records in spaces such as the Bringing Them Home report and the online testimonies are exercises not only in rewriting history, but in, achieve, in achieving discursive justice. The value of understanding these documentary records through survivors' testimonies is that these testimonies provide a means to set the records straight. The law is one venue in which we expect justice to be done. But in the case of stolen generations, the law has not dealt well with Australia's history. There have only been a handful of cases dealing with compensation for members of the stolen generations. And only one of these claims in the Trevorrow cases has been successful. In a broad sense, there's been a problem with the law overemphasizing the role of the documentary record in comparison to oral testimony given in the hearings behind these cases. In the earlier case of Cabillo, where the claimant where the claimants failed, Justice O'Loughlin spoke of the huge void created by the absence of documentary evidence as a key explanation for the failure of the claims, despite the availability of significant oral testimony. Another issue has been the law's role in affirming problematic stories of removal. One of the issues considered by the court in Cabillo was the role of the consent by the mother of Peter Gunner, one of the applicants. Essentially, the Commonwealth sought to recharacterise the act of removal as consensual and authorised by the parents. The government presented a document with a thumbprint on it, purportedly that of Peter Gunner's mother, as evidence that Gunner's mother had consented to his removal. Justice O'Loughlin found that the documents reflected Gunner's mother's informed consent. In doing so, he failed to adequately acknowledge the power disparity between the government agency and Aboriginal persons, as well as the wider historical and social context in which many Aboriginal parents, such as Topsy Gunner, were not literate in English and were therefore unlikely to have understood the content and implications of the form on which her thumbprint appears. The case perpetuates a harmful story that mothers consented to the removal of their children. By contrast, in the Trevorrow cases, the South Australian courts expressed a distrust of the documentary record relating to parental consent. The court noted, when necessary, in the perceived interests of a child, the Aborigines Protection Board would place a child in an institution or with a foster family without parental consent, using a pretense of power, which undoubtedly would have been effective, and if appropriate, using an element of bluff or deception. Such findings would seem to be good news for survivors of the stolen generations and would seem to indicate that courts in the future might look carefully and properly, contextually, at documentary archives. But the success of Bruce Trevorrow's case in 2010 has not led to further claims on behalf of members of the stolen generations. The problem is that Bruce Trevorrow's case is unique in that no document was found in his records that indicated his parents' formal consent and the file also provided evidence by way of letters that his mother, Thora Carpeny, did not consent to his removal. This documentary support is rare. It's not available where parents sign documents prior to removal, such as in Topsy Gunner's case, and these have been preserved in the files. And it's also not available where um, parents have signed with not, with, without understanding what they were signing or signed under duress or as a result of the processes of bluff or deception that was noted by the court in Trevoro. So far, the courts have not been presented with this kind of case, so there is an open question as to what a court might do if presented with a contradiction between um, the oral testimony and the documentary record. But going on the precedent of Cabillo, um, my suspicion would be that um, it, it would be difficult for a court to find against the documentary record. The common law has played a large role, not only in adjudicating the past, but also in deciding what counts as history, in circulating evidence and stories about Australia's past and deciding how they matter. But it is important that the law's version not be the only version that counts in public life. The common law has interpreted the historical record very narrowly 
and has effectively failed at becoming a forum for the adjudication of stolen generations cases. The online testimonies provide further evidence not only of the contradictions between the documents produced by the government surrounding the removal of children, but the frequent negligence and even, will, even willful dishonesty and deceit in the creation of these records. These testimonies have to do so much work, perhaps too much work, for one form to achieve. They stand against the law and the law's privileging of the government record. They stand against the forgetfulness of the post-colonial state. And here I refer to Leela Gandhi's notion of post-colonial amnesia, where, quote, reconciliation as a rhetorical construction is characterized by the trope of absence, of willed forgetting and silence, functioning as a failed historicity. Post-colonial amnesia is symptomatic of the urge for historical self-invention or the need to make a new start, to erase painful memories of colonial subordination, end quote. So in a way, I would argue that we've, a, we've come to a point where um, testimony has become disciplinary. So it's crafting certain sorts of stories that, um, that mean that indigenous subjects are produced and understood in a particular way. So the four moments that I would suggest are key here are Kubilo and the documentary record. So here, on one hand, the, the court talks about forcible removal that is still legal, finds against the claimants, um, but also finds that there's a, a void at the centre of the evidence, despite there being significant oral testimony. Um, in Trevorrow, we have a success for the plaintiffs, uh, for the plaintiff, but um, unfortunately, we have this circulation of parental consent. So parental consent still becomes key to the success of the claim. And so that's a, a story that circulates um, not only in the law, but um, in, in the public sphere. Um, so uh, it generates ideas about the good parent, the bad parent, the good parent who refuses to consent and who fights the state to um, maintain contact with their child, um, but the problem with that is um, some parents were coerced into signing consent forms um, or, or just didn't have the means to be able to pursue the state, or perhaps they did pursue the state and that documentary record has been lost. Um, third, um, the Northern Territory intervention and familial abnormality. So I won't go into too much detail here, but um, in 2007, um, there was a legislative, legislative response from the federal government um, following an inquiry into the protection of Aboriginal children. Um, so this was called the Little Children, a Sacred Report. So the, you can hear the resonance there with bringing them home. Um, and it, it introduced a number of controversial measures, um, including control and restrictions of welfare payments to um, Indigenous Australians. Um, based on, on certain welfare requirements. Um, so the, the point there is that we, we have, again, this narrative of familial abnormality, which, which I would argue arises out of testimony having this disciplinary function. So um, an idea about what the normal family um, is um, and, um, and the, the, that Indigenous families fall outside those norms uh, without an exploration of, say, the function of racism um, and structural inequalities. And the fourth point I would suggest is a non-moment, which is the absence of a reparation scheme. So um, I would suggest we need a new language and narrative, especially one of responsibility, um, because as it stands, this suffering subject and suffering na narrative dominates. Um, and this is what's taken up as part of a, a kind of family romance so into the Little Children's Sacred Report, um, rather than um, a narrative that um, emphasises a responsible state and public. <coughs> so the meta-narrative of the stolen generations is certain arc that the, the narratives individually follow and then collectively follow arises from a range of sources and genres, legal, literary, political, and it has led to a particular kind of story generating certain binaries and emphases and also certain kinds of affective and pedagogical responses. We might say that it emphasises suffering over responsibility, call over response, persuasion or affect over right. It is significant that in 12, 2012 we had the government funding another repository of testimonies rather than working towards a reparation scheme or other compensatory measures or any measure that articulates a position of responsibility rather than a form that emphasises Indigenous suffering. 
the tone becomes one of supplication rather than one of right, despite the 1997 Heriot report outlining the rights of Indigenous survivors under the principles of international law. Australia therefore needs to work on a new narrative, one of responsibility, to mine the testimonies for evidence of government failures, um, such as Deborah Hocking's um, testimony to the ways in which um, the, the state read um, her mother's actions in trying to preserve her culture as, as being coded as neglect. To emphasise the omissions and neglects of governments and to develop a language of failures rather than of suffering. The project of reconciliation has been the officially sanctioned discourse in Australia to describe the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. Reconciliation has many versions, many stories, but the version that encourages a relinquishment, a relinquishment of the past in favour of a blank future, posited as full of open potential, is not only problematic but impossible. This is a version of reconciliation in which post-colonial is perceived to mean that we have surpassed colonial practices. The most extreme version is the Howard government's refusal to, apo to apologise. But we need to look more closely at the half measures too. The half measures of the Rudd government's apology, of case law, and Australians' collective stance on our relationship to history, and what has been done and is being done in our name. Rudd's apology speaks of a future that embraces all Australians, but without providing for a system of reparation, such a statement pretends that moving on is possible without the full recognition of responsibility on the part of non-Indigenous Australia. It pretends that Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians hold equal positions with respect to both the past and the future. What this half-justice does is effectively leave the burden of history with Indigenous Australians, the pain and suffering so poignantly described in the testimonies is to be carried only by those who suffer and not by the institutions, cultures and legal systems that cause the suffering. Australia needs to re-encounter the past and question the legitimacy of practices that have taken place in the name of the nation. We have seen above how the common law has not become an adequate venue for the pursuit of these questions. So many survivors are unable to ac access justice in this way because of the weight of precedent against them and because of continuing problems the ways in which their evidence is likely to be interpreted. There is an arbitrariness in the way in which Bruce Trevorrow's claim succeeded where many others have failed. There is also injustice in compelling, compelling survivors to endure the vagaries of litigation in the hope of pushing the common law incrementally into a nuanced understanding of history and evidence. For these reasons, Australia should look to these testimonies as further support for the need for a federal reparations scheme, as was recommended by the Bringing Them Home report, and has, be has been implemented in a limited sense in Tasmania. Such a scheme has the advantage of removing the arbitrariness of litigation. It also has a great advantage of setting the records straight. It would be a means by which the policies of removal could be acknowledged and documented we could get the wording right and acknowledge that the documentary record so far has been flawed and incorrect. The legislation could incorporate the testimonies of survivors and use their words, their demands in achieving present day justice. Thank you.